Washington Journal continues. We're back with Dan Glickman, a familiar face to, I'm sure, many of you. He's now chairman of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, former House member, former Agriculture Secretary. Discussion today is about foreign aid. As this Deficit Reduction Committee begins their work, and we learned the Republicans met yesterday, Democrats are going to have a conference call today, foreign aid could be on the chopping block. Let's just begin first with, what do you mean by foreign aid? What, is that, what does that constitute? Well, foreign assistance is generally referred to in two basic areas. One is the non-military foreign assistance, food aid, humanitarian assistance, uh, development assistance around the world, helping countries become more self-sufficient. Right now, we're providing a lot of food aid to the Horn of Africa, Somalia. That's in the foreign aid account. Then you have uh, more national security-related foreign aid, or more directly related to war effort, the reconstruction of Pakistan in Afghanistan. And the total foreign aid budget is about 1% of the total budget of the United States. It, right, but it's how much in billions of dollars? Well, it's roughly about $50 billion. And, and when you count the military side of the foreign aid, you're close to $55 billion. But, uh, but uh, a lot of folks, when they're asked, well, we spend too much money on foreign aid. So I remember when I was in the House, I used to say, well, how much do we spend on foreign aid? People would say 25% of the budget, 15% of the budget, 10% of the budget. The truth is, it's about 1% of the budget covers all this foreign assistance, including food assistance, development assistance, humanitarian assistance. So it's actually a very, very small part of the total budget of the United States. Yeah, when, when folks hear $50 billion, that sounds like a lot of money, and that is a lot of money. And so in these economic times when, when folks don't have jobs and, and they're struggling here, why should we spend, be spending even that amount on well, foreign aid? Well, first of all, uh, you got to consider this in the whole package. We spend probably 20 times that amount in the defense picture of the United States to protect America's national security. And in effect, a lot of the foreign aid actually is part of the national security function. By providing countries with the development assistance, they become politically secure so they don't revolt. We saw in North Africa, Tunisia, uh, part in Libya to some extent, clearly in Egypt, a lot of the insurrection occurred because of economic problems, food prices, that kind of thing. So uh, providing this assistance can keep these countries stable. It could also provide long-term economic development, which then becomes a market for the United States and allows jobs to flourish here. But a big part of our foreign assistance is in humanitarian assistance. It's for people who are hungry, who are starving, uh, who need medical assistance, who need immunizations. And that's where the United States has been a leader throughout the world. And while we recognize that no area can be totally exempt and immune from budget cuts, this is a very important part of the U.S. projection of power and influence around the world. And in many respects, it's just as important as the defense uh, dollars that we spend every day. So why is the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition uh, part of this? I mean, why are you advocating to keep foreign aid as it is, or are you advocating for, for more money? And, and what's the worst-case scenario uh, that this Deficit Reduction Committee decides to, to get rid of half, let's say, of, of foreign aid or, or, or more? Well, you know, look, I was a congressman for many years, and I also ran a federal agency, and I know that no area is immune from looking at, at the budget process, and you can't say, well, cut everywhere else, but not here. The question is one of degree, and w the fact is we're not making giant cuts in our defense budget because we know that that's necessary for the national security of the United States. These dollars go, in many respects, to augment our national security budget by providing economic assistance that builds stable societies, as well as humanitarian assistance, food aid, vaccinations, medical assistance. Uh, we've cut the rate of polio, for example, in Africa almost in half, largely because our, of our foreign assistance. So it, it, it's a complement to our national security budget. And if we were to cut it dramatically, it would have grave humanitarian consequences around the world. We're seeing, seeing right now one of the largest famines in history in East Africa. And based on my knowledge of agriculture, food issues, climate issues, we're going to see a lot more of these problems involving food insufficiency around the world. So if we disengage as Americans, uh, it will be extremely harmful to our national security interests. And let me tell you what else is going to happen. Other countries, the Chinese and the Indians, they will pick up the slack. They're already moving very, very strongly in Africa and in the subcontinent of Asia as well. So no longer will the United States be the strongest dominant force in these parts of the world. Well, 
answer the question too about U.S. Global Leadership Coalition okay, before I'm we sorry. move on. I'm That's sorry. all right. This is a coalition of American corporations, and some of the largest corporations in the world, some of the largest non-government organizations like CARE and other uh, humanitarian organizations, and, and a whole assortment of veterans group and national security leaders. We have lots of former uh, uh, flag officers, generals, admirals, and others uh, who are pushing what's, what we call for smart power, which means for the United States to maintain leadership in the world, for us to build the kind of relationships that we need around the world that will give us uh, economic relationships and political relationships and humanitarian relationships, these organizations have coalesced together behind the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition as a kind of a, a, a group of assorted interests that are fighting to maintain uh, um, foreign assistance, adequate foreign assistance funding. And, and it's interesting to find veterans leaders, uh, former generals, admirals, flag officers joining with American corporate leaders, humanitarian leaders, and wanting to make sure that America maintains its leadership in these issues because it has national security consequences, it has economic consequences, because when you build stable so societies, they tend to buy more American products, which means jobs in this country as well. So it's kind of a, a coalition of, of uh, the willing, I guess you'd say. Some co people call it a very strange bedfellows of right and left conservatives and liberals working together to preserve this power that the United States has exerted for so many years. Let me show our viewers some numbers put together by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, from April 6, 2011. They put the foreign assistance by country in 2010 for the United States at about 30 billion, United Kingdom uh, around 14 billion, France 13 billion, Germany 13 billion, Japan 11 billion. Why are we almost double, or more, more than double, uh, than these other countries? And what if we were to scale back to their level? Uh, first of all, uh, in previous years, we were probably five, six, and seven times greater. Our foreign assistance budget has not gone up in real terms. Uh, for many, many years when you consider all of the economic and humanitarian side of the picture. If we were to cut back significantly, my prediction is the other countries wouldn't go up. Who might go up is China and the Chinese, maybe the Indians, but the Chinese are very active and they have political reasons, I think, for engaging this area. I think that uh, food assistance is in great jeopardy. Uh, as it is in the House budget, uh, looking at these issues, there was a 30 percent cut in food assistance for humanitarian purposes. I think a lot of people would go hungry. I think there'd be economic disarray around the world. It's not in our interest to see that happen. And you know, the United States, our power and influence is in large part due not only to our military power, but to our economic power and our power of values and our power to help people who are struggling. And again, this is 1% of the budget of the United States. If it were, if it were 20 or 25%, I think some of the, the concerns would be justified, but it's not. We'll get to phone calls here in just a minute. We're talking to Dan Glipman about the U.S. Uh, Global Leadership Coalition. He's the chairman of a bipartisan group uh, advocating for, for foreign aid. Um, let's, let's talk to Ray, who's an independent in uh, Alaska. Ray, you're on the air with Dan Glipman. Go ahead. Good morning, hello. Ray. Yes, hello? Yes, hi. Good morning. Yeah, this is uh, Ray. I'm in Alaska, and I, I just feel that uh, the economic value in, the, in the, our country is not as rich as what it's put up, as what it's made out to be. And I feel like that we should uh, put more, um, more focus to our country and not to the other countries. And I do believe that uh, America was a power in the past, but with our recent credit rating dropping and with our, our economy, I think that we should spend more money taking care of our own country. Well, I understand that, and uh, you know, by, by and large, I kind of agree with that. I mean, the, the heart of what our country ought to be uh, is to take care of ourselves. I hope the president comes up with a good jobs package uh, next week. But again, I'd point out a couple things. We're talking about 1% of the budget, not 15, not 20, not 25, but 1% of the budget. Uh, we spend far more than that in defense figures uh, to do a lot of the same thing to protect national, America's national security interests. The second point I would point out is most of the jobs in the future for American workers will be based upon exports around the world. That's where 90% of the population is. 
For us to export commodities around the world, it means that countries and governments have to be politically stable, have to be strong, have to have the appropriate economic development so they can buy our stuff, and therefore they can then employ our workers, buy our airplanes, buy our farm equipment, all those kinds of things. And so the market opportunities are great, but they're greater where these countries around the world are much more stable and where there is assistance to build roads and sewers and to help people from starving to death and be immunized from serious disease. So I understand what Ray is saying, but I also believe that the long-term economic future of the United States is tied to the development of the rest of the world as you, well. You mentioned other countries will step in, like China and yeah. India, if the United States were to withdraw its, its foreign yeah. assistance. Does China and India attach strings to the money that they give? And if so, do we do the same? Uh, by and large, we attach less strings than, than they do. The, the Chinese particularly have been very active in sub-Saharan Africa, and they come in, and in many cases, they, the quid pro quo for their coming in is extracting minerals um, or other precious uh, resources that are needed. And, you know, by and large, the U.S. foreign assistance uh, program, whether administered through the Agency for International Development or through nonprofit organizations, is geared towards kind of rebuilding uh, na uh, uh, national infrastructure, health, agriculture, feeding, uh, building, you know, basically the, the foundations of a modern society. So, you know, I, I would say that over the years, the heart of our assistance has been much more humanitarian and much less strings related in other parts of the world. Should we put strings on this money? Well, I mean, what about loans and having countries pay us back when they reach a certain of, level? Of, of course, that any type that you, where you have loans, and a lot of that's done through the World Bank and the international financial institutions and not direct aid. And of course, we want to make sure that the countries who receive our aid are have relatively democratic principles because we're seeing all over North Africa, you know, people are throwing out uh, totalitarian leaders. But I point out that the big chunk of our assistance has been in food aid, health aid, immunization, and, 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 and trying to sanitation, sewers, all those kinds of things to try to build basic societies so they can flourish, they can become economic partners, and in many respects, they can buy our stuff. Here are the top agencies providing U.S. foreign aid. U.S. AID, about $11 billion. State Department, $9 billion. Agriculture Department, $2.5 billion, Defense Department about $2 billion, and uh, Treasury Department $1.7 billion. We'll go next to Mike, Democratic caller in Minneapolis. Morning, Mike. Hi. Good morning. Um, you get, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous here, but you, get, you do get a little confused on this. Uh, the, when I'm listening to this, the tape going back and forth. <laughs> um, delayed reaction. Hey. Anyways, um, um, uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Can I turn yes. my TV off? Yeah, no. that, Mike, that's a problem. Off, but, okay. You gotta, you gotta turn uh, the Mr. volume Glickman? down. Mr. Glickman? Yes, sir. Uh, you're living in a, in a la-la land, to be frank with you. This country here in the United States, basically, if you look out there, it's falling apart. Uh, I, and it's not just from foreign aid. I mean, you're talking about stabilizing other countries. Look at our own country. It, it's, it's a mess. Uh, you're talking about yep. feeding, feeding children um, in other countries. They, I think it's, what is it, one out of four kids in the United States, something along those lines, are going to bed hungry. Uh, you're talking about a global economy. We don't need a global economy. Um, you're exactly on the wrong path. All right. Okay, all right. First of all, Mike, we do need a global economy. If you work for the Boeing company, 60% uh, of the airplanes and 60% of the workers are uh, for sales overseas, not in the United States. We need people to buy those airplanes. Caterpillar, John Deere, you need people to buy those tractors. Uh, we sell every, almost everything we make outside the United States more than we sell inside the United States. And we need to sell more of that than we do right now. So without a global economy, we are dead as a nation. We will not survive. Now, I do agree with the fact that there has not been enough attention focused over the last 30 or 40, 50 years to rebuilding the American infrastructure, the American workplace, uh, the American economy. And that's got to be that's got to be the heart and the focus of what we're doing. But for the one percent of the budget, I repeat this, for the one percent of the budget that goes to foreign assistance, we can do two or three things that can help us with the economy. We can help build infrastructure of companies and countries 
that will then grow and buy things from the United States. And that is beginning to happen all over Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where these countries have become, in many respects, much stronger, and they're buying a lot of these airplanes and farm equipment and that kinds of things. Second of all, from a humanitarian point of view, America has always been a leader in helping the rest of the world survive and cope with disease and hunger. And we are kind of the moral force of the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to take on the total responsibility ourselves. We don't have the money to do that anymore. And that's why I'm not arguing for 5% of the budget or 10% of the budget. I'm just saying that at current levels, at roughly about 1% of the budget, it uh, augments American power and our ability to influence the world so that we can continue to be strong and continue to provide jobs for Americans as well. And that's why the Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, that's why the military leaders all over this country, General Petraeus and others, have said this part of our budget is critical to America's national security. And so I, you know, I don't argue with your base premise, but I argue with the fact that we should just s drop all our assistance to the rest of the world. I don't think that helps America at all, and it certainly doesn't help American workers. Margaret's a Republican in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, hello. Morning. Yes, ma'am. Hi. The one thing that concerns me is we, our foreign aid. We have everybody. We're listening, Margaret. Yeah. We, we help uh, everybody. The one thing like Hades, you see those men, adult men, sitting down waiting for us to come over there and do something for them. I think we need to do help people that help themselves. All right. Thank and, you. and I agree with you totally, Margaret. Uh, uh, for years, I think in, in some respects, we did create a culture of dependency in some parts of the world. But under the leadership of Raj Shah at USAID, that's the primary agency that provides foreign assistance, under all the assistance that provided by the Department of Agriculture, Department of Defense, and others, the idea is to help people help themselves, help people feed themselves, help people grow their own economies uh, through the kind of assistance that we provide. Uh, and so I think you are spot on there. Here's a tweet from Linda who says, why are we giving foreign aid to our creditor nations like China? Why should that not be credited to our debt instead? Well, I, uh, I'm not aware of any foreign assistance that's going directly to China anymore. Uh, and, and, you know, I think we had uh, certainly over the years a lot of assistance going to India. Um, and that is waning as the Indians become much more economically powerful. But the Chinese are big competitors of ours. The Chinese are in sub-Saharan Africa. They're all over East Africa building roads, sewers, water systems. And what do they get for that? They get access to precious minerals and materials and other things that help them become a much stronger economic power. So to some extent, uh, the new challenge in the world is for us to compete with the Chinese and other countries who are all over the world developing these relationships, building these societies so that they can then sh uh, ship the assets back and, and produce more jobs at home. We need to be competing directly with that as well. And USAID is part of the State Department. So they do their own foreign assistance work. And then you have the State Department, because we showed the numbers before. There they are again. State Department about $9 billion in other type of foreign assistance but, but, programs. But, but the State Department is, in many respects, in war-related uh, development, like in Afghanistan and Pakistan and other things. So the, the heart of U.S. foreign uh, assistance uh, is run through the U.S. Agency for International Development. And then in the area of food assistance, where traditionally we've been leaders in the world, the United States historically has supplied over half uh, of the food assistance to hungry people around the world. And that's in great jeopardy right now as people are getting hungrier, as weather is making it more difficult for farmers all over the world. And it's something that we're going to have to really have a, a top focus on in the future. Jody Tom has this comment on Twitter. The United States is 5% of the population who uses 25% of the resources of the world. You do the math. Well, I think she's kind of making my point in a sense that uh, uh, the reason for going into these these countries. Well, I th I think that the reason for going into these countries is, is twofold, as I mentioned before. I mean, we're a, we have historically been the richest country in the world. I still think we're the richest country in the world, but to some extent that's being jeopardized for a lot of different reasons. One is we haven't invested enough at home over the future, at, over the past, and I've agreed with some of the callers on that. But that's no reason for us to withdraw and to be you know, uh, unilateralist. It's interesting. Years and years, years ago, Will Rogers 
once made this comment. He says, you know, America has two of the greatest friends in the world. You know who they are. He said they're the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. We, we've always kind of had a little bit of an isolationist streak in this country, and I understand it because we haven't had to deal with foreign governments because they've been separated. We've just had Canada and Mexico, basically, who have been allies for this country over the years. But the fact of the matter is we are in a world economy. We're in a global economy, and a majority of American jobs are going to be dependent upon exports around the world. And in order for us to compete with the Chinese and others, we have to develop markets all over the world, which means that the developing world has to be in a position with the adequate amount of sewers and roads and people who eat and people who aren't hungry and people who aren't destabilized, so they'll grow and they'll buy our products. Let's listen to Bernie in Independent in Columbus, Ohio. Hello, sir. Uh, this is just another global corporatist plot that sends our money overseas after they sent all our jobs overseas. Also, we give so much money to Israel and to Egypt, both of which have caused more problems in the area. And because Israel won't make peace, we continue to spend billions of dollars in wars in uh, the Middle East, which are unnecessary. All right. Okay, first of all, I mean, I would take issue. I don't think it's a global plot. You may disagree with the policy of it. But I want to give you just a couple of statistics. Thanks to American development assistance, the number of children dying before their fifth birthday in the world has been cut in half. Polio cases in Africa have been reduced by over 90% in 20 years. And more than three-quarters of African youngsters are now enrolled in primary school, up from 58% in 1999. Thanks for President Bush and President Clinton and President Obama's PEPFAR, or AIDS relief plan, over 2.5 million people have received life-saving antiretroviral drugs, and uh, we have made significant progress in the fight against AIDS all over the world. Um, hundreds of millions of people have been helped through U.S. assistance with food assistance, natural disaster, disaster assistance, and uh, many of the USAID recipients of small finance projects, not corporate projects, small finance proje projects around the world have, becoming, uh, have become self-sustaining business owners, and many of those are now importing products from the United States. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I understand the concern there, and um, I'm not necessarily saying that I agree with all U.S. policies over the years in terms of the allocation of resources between big corporations and smaller businesses. But most of this development assistance goes to help people who are hurting around the world. And that's, and that's always been in the United States' interest. And that's the definition of foreign aid versus military aid. That's right. Military aid is, of course, uh, military aid to Israel, Egypt, Pakistan. And the United States has found that that's in its political and military interest to deal with those issues. But largely what I'm talking about today is development assistance. Who received foreign aid in uh, 2009? Afghanistan tops the list at $3 billion, followed by Iraq, $2.2 billion, Pakistan, about $1.3 billion, the Sudan, $1.1 billion, and then the West Bank, Gaza, about $1 billion. And that's economic, by and large, economic assistance numbers, not the military assistance numbers that the gentleman was talking about. Right. Tyson, a Republican in Spokane, Washington. Go ahead. Thank you for C-SPAN, a great network, and uh, thank you for uh, Dan, who is a great guest with great points, which is making this a great eye-opening statement uh, segment. I really think, uh, you know, the mid, uh, the uh, left and the right uh, handout leeches in this country should really take a step back and realize what they have and what this country offers all of us. You know, I honestly, Dan, felt a couple weeks ago that, yeah, maybe we shouldn't be giving so much money away. Maybe we should be focusing more on the homeland. Uh, but listening to your segment here, sir, and how intelligently you're speaking and coming across, you make complete sense. We, uh, a majority of this uh, world is hurting. Okay, let's read, you know, let's think about maybe Pakistan, some other countries that might, countries that might, funnel some of this capital into a different way. But like uh, you took a quote from Will Rogers, it's uh, ironic because I have one too. Uh, Will Rogers said that we are one of the richest and, and most blessed countries in the world to where we drive our vehicles to the food line. I mean, it's, you know, he was right on there. We are blessed and we are lucky in this country. 
And I think everybody should uh, should basically listen to what you have to say and, uh, and be uh, very grateful for the country we live in. God bless the USA. All right. Thank you. I'll I make just a couple comments. That wasn't my brother who called me. I want to make sure everybody knows that. Uh, you know, the one comment is, is that foreign assistance, economic development assistance, has been extremely bipartisan for many, many years. Basically, since the time of the, of the post-Second World War area, it was President Herbert Hoover, who President Roosevelt uh, deputized to do a massive effort to feed the world. It was the Marshall Plan under President Truman, which Dwight Eisenhower continued and expanded. It was the Food for Peace program that de developed by President Kennedy. Uh, President Nixon then continued on very, very strongly. I was in Africa uh, in March. I went to Tanzania and Mozambique, uh, and I met people who said that they thought that we, America had three great leaders, and, and it was interesting. Who were those great leaders? It was President George Bush for his efforts on PEPFAR, AIDS, malaria, it was President uh, Bill Clinton, who they saw largely through his efforts in the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton Global Initiative, and President Barack Obama. And I'm thinking, here I am in Africa, and all, I find that the three heroes of the African continent in Ameri in, in, of American leadership are a Republican President Bush and two Democratic Presidents, Clinton and Obama. By the way, we are very popular in that region of the world. We're not popular in a lot of places, but we're quite popular in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and so, and almost a third of the countries in the UN General Assembly are from Africa. So there's great political benefit for us to do the right thing as well. Gary Duncan has this tweet about Africa. Why are the African nations so rich in natural resources, so negligent in caring for basic health needs of its people? Not our problem, he says. Well, uh, I, it is our problem if you think that they're going to be citizens of the world who are going to be contributing and who are going to be growing and maybe buying our products and maybe providing help in America's national security. You, can't, you just can't neglect a continent, uh, and, and uh, they have great natural resources. Some countries are doing better than ours. They have not had uh, adequate legal systems uh, and certainly not much infrastructure, road, sewers, water system. Uh, but but there's promise. There's a lot of movement happening around the world, and, and, and especially in, in the developing world. And when you look at the future of the world, the growth is likely to take place in the developing world, like in Africa and Asia, and that's where the economic power is going to be. And I predict 20 or 30 years from now, you're going to see great economic development and great economic power in the places in the world where you haven't seen it over the last 30 or 40 years. And the United States needs to be engaged in those parts of the world or else we're going to lose. We're going to lose to the Chinese. We're going to lose to the Russians. We're going to lose to, to a lot of other folks who will become economically superior to us. I don't think that's in our national interest. Charles is a Democrat in Jackson, Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, good morning. I would like to ask a couple of questions, but first of all, I want to know, since we are the richest country in the world, like it's been said, why is it that we never say anything about Australia? Which I want uh, to Charles, I'm sorry, about what? Australia. Australia? Australia. Yeah. I want to contradict the uh, man for a little bit, because Australia is the only continent that is really surrounded by water, and no one has access to Australia unless they fly in or buy a boat. Now, Australia also has here, in this country, gas stations. They have uh, several other types of businesses that are taking out of here, but what do we get from Australia? And what All right, we'll, we'll leave it there, Dan. Glickman. Well, Australia is a, is a fine country. It's also a very small country, and uh, its population is largely on the coasts because Australia is... Uh, primarily a big giant desert and Arab, arid country without a lot of uh, agriculture, although they do produce a lot of wheat and they are a strong agriculture country, but, but uh, in terms of its very small population and it uh, doesn't have anywhere near the economic power of the United States. Here's a, another tweet to, from K, K. Wright 39. Why are women and children starving in Somalia if we've given billions in aid, alluding to the waste and the corruption and the fraud that you see? Uh, well, first of all, uh, for the last several years, a lot of the aid hasn't reached Somalia because you've had warlords and al-Qaeda-related operations who have basically kept the humanitarian assistance, the United Nations out, other humanitarian organizations out. And just recently, we've begun to get some humanitarian aid into Somalia. Uh, but How do you prevent that? 
You know, it's a very, very difficult problem. We've actually had some impact in other parts of East Africa, Ethiopia and Kenya um, and Djibouti, which is another country in the area. There's actually been less problems than there would have been because there's been greater economic growth and better agriculture practices. But Somalia has been a country that's been run by warlords, has no legal system. Uh, it basically uh, is a chaotic, almost uncivilized country. So it's ex been extremely difficult to establish any economic systems. And in a place like Somalia, uh, as opposed to other places in Africa, our, our big challenge is to feed people and keep them from dying uh, as they both die in Somalia and as they move into refugee camps in other parts of the world, in Ted other parts of Africa. Ted is joining us in Indianapolis on the Independent Line. Hello, this is Ted Britton from Indianapolis. Yes, sir. Uh, just a minute. Uh, I have a, uh, two comments for you, Mr. Uh, Glickman. I uh, am a farm manager. I'm retired, age 70. Uh, I uh, had a master's degree in ag econ, and I disagree with you much on the five stages of economic growth. And I agree with you that roads and sewers and economic infrastructure are required. But my statement to you is... I don't think we can afford it anymore because I think as our nation, we have too much debt and maybe we can't afford to have, I think we need, I believe in foreign aid, but the problem is it's very inefficient. And when the State Department had an interview the other day and said they only get 20% to the people who need it when they ship food to Somalia because there's no infrastructure and the warlords uh, steal it. All right, we were just talking about that. But Mr. Yeah, well, Glickman. look, Somalia is different because of warlords, chaos, al-Qaeda-related operations. Other parts of the world, uh, the people will get virtually all the aid that's sent to them. But I, I want to go back to this point because as a farm manager, you know that uh, to produce in agriculture, you need a lot of things. You need roads, sewers, ways to get your crops to market. You also need good seeds. You need to understand farming practices. You need marketing. And all these things are, are, are part of what is now happening in that part of the world, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and South Asia. And th th within the next 20 or 30 years, these people could become great producers of food, which means they'd be great buyers of American products, seeds, farm equipment, that kinds of things. It's already beginning to happen. Again, when I was in Tanzania, I saw a number of John Deere tractors when I was out there. So, so you know, it's complicated. I'm not saying that this is an easy thing to do. I'm just saying that for less than 1% of our budget, we basically provide this kind of assistance to the rest of the world. Let's go to uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Republican line. Uh, Anastasia? Hi, yes. Um, I was actually uh, calling in in reference to the, uh, the tweet from earlier um, with the comment that we use 25% of the resources. Um, and my comment is that even though we use 25% of the resources, we also ship out so much aid and help to these other countries that a lot of the resources that we use actually do get spread around the world. But also, with the food shortage going on around the world, why are we paying our farmers to keep their fields fallow? Is that just for the, the search for the all-American dollar, which actually isn't, you know, all that great right now? Or is it, you know, for some, for some other purpose, because I'm, I get really confused whenever I, I read reports and see the news on that. Oh, well, that's a good question. And by and large, we don't pay our farmers to keep their fields fallow anymore. We did that in the 80s and 90s when we had big surpluses. The only place that happens is in conservation programs, where we have a large program called the Conservation Reserve Program, where we basically pay people to keep highly erodible land out of production in the hopes of trying to preserve it, preserve the soil, and preserve it for wildlife. And even that we're looking at right now to see whether we, are, we have too much of that land in, in these conservation fields. But we are entering a period of, uh, an, uh, we're ending the period of surpluses in farm uh, supplies. And for years we had excessive supplies of wheat, corn, soybeans. Those days are over. With economic growth in the third world, with uh, population growth, the big problem in the future is going to be, can we produce enough food for the world? And that's why the problems of hunger, both at home and around the world, are even more serious. Because when we had lots of surplus food available, it was easier to feed the world. But now it's going to be a lot trickier because uh, the, the 
equilibrium between supply and demand of food is going to be a lot tighter than it ever was before. Here's an email from Tom in New York. How about the countries that simply rely on foreign aid as their base economy? Also, please address the issue that aid in many cases is simply a band-aid, not a real long-term solution as you bring aid the populations of these countries continue to grow with no real way of supporting themselves. I think that's a good question. And I, I think you, if you talk to the folks at the Agency for International Development, they are in the period of changing the methodology on foreign assistance to investment and to help countries grow themselves and to become more self-sufficient. There's a program called Feed the Future, which is tried to gearing to farmers become self-sufficient so they don't have to rely on food aid and they don't have to rely on grants and that kind of stuff. And the foundations, Ford Foundation, Gates, Clinton, Rockefeller and others are all over the developing world trying to encourage uh, self-sufficiency, uh, not reliance, uh, but self-sufficiency, and that's a uh, that's fairly new. Uh, a friend of mine is Howard Buffett, who's Warren Buffett's son, who's been very personally involved in economic development efforts in East Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and just the whole focus over the last five years has changed from one of just kind of pouring gifts in to one that really encourages self-sufficiency and economic development. We'll go next to Ronald, Youngston, uh, Youngstown, Ohio, excuse me, Democratic Line. Yeah, good morning. Yes, sir. Morning. Uh, the, I just wanted to say the Midwest is full of evidence, okay, that free trade hasn't worked. And no, it's not the work of wages. No, it's not our standard of living. No, it's not our unions. It's classic Ricardian economic policy that's done this to us, okay? And then secondly... The attempt for the last 50 years has been to pocket the difference between our way of life and third world countries' way of investing. That difference would be going into our coffers had our politicians and economists had sense to use import rates to increase demand in this country, okay, thereby increasing employment and all the good revenue things that will come from employment and industry in this country, okay? Well, let's get a response. Okay. Well, first of all, I can't go into great detail about how our economic or industrial policy over the last 30 or 40 years hasn't worked or not worked. In many respects, I agree with the caller that we've made some very fundamental, serious mistakes. But the heartland of this country is benefiting from a significant increase of farm exports overseas. And we have, in many respects, some of the highest farm prices in history. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that's been caused by the growth and demand around the world. So regardless of what the gentleman says, and he may be right in terms of industrial policy, in terms of our ability to keep it involved in the rest of the world and grow economies so they can buy our stuff, I think that's very important for the future of workers in this country. That is, we will not produce a workforce without some interdependency in the rest of the world. Now, we've got to make sure it's fair, and we've got to make sure that trade laws are being properly enforced. So. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to blame everything on this idea that we have relationships with the rest of the world. Second of all, on the humanitarian side, we have saved tens of millions of people from dying. The United States of America in the last 30 to 40 years has saved tens of millions of people from dying from starvation and from disease. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that's part of our value system in America. And maybe the rest of the world doesn't share that. But I think that's a pretty damn good thing for our country to be doing. Anchorage, Alaska. Bob, independent Trade is an, is an absolute necessity, and I agree that uh, we should always have uh, uh, help foreign countries and so on. But I don't understand why we are minimizing. I mean, only 1% of our budget goes into foreign trade, but 1% of our budget is trillions of dollars. And, uh, for instance, uh, we have foreign trade uh, money to like two point some billion dollars goes to Turkey. Well, we also have a defense budget of $120 billion on the Pakistan border uh, to defend our country and to train um, soldiers from other country. But the long and short of what I'm saying is that uh, we are minimizing a 1% of our budget is a lot of money. All right. It is a lot of money, but it's not trillions of dollars. So I need to make that clear because I, when I was in the Congress, I used to go to town hall meetings, and sometimes I would get numbers wrong, but sometimes my constituents get, get numbers wrong. And 1% of the budget is, in this case, less than 1% of the budget in this case, is roughly about $50 billion that's going into uh, international development assistance. It's a lot of money. I don't want to minimize it. 
but I think the benefit, if spent well, is very great to the United States. Dan Glickman, thank you for talking to our viewers. Appreciate it. I enjoyed it a lot. Coming up next, we uh, are in day two of our series, Tracking the Weather. Climatology is our topic, but first, a news update from C-SPAN Radio. It's 9.15 a.m. Eastern. An update on the job market from global consultant Challenger Gray and Christmas.